Hello, everyone, and welcome to our three-part colorism series with the Racial Unity Team. My name is Tanisha Johnson, and I am on the board of RUT. Um, for those who may not know, um, Racial Unity Team was born out of the tragic June 2015 shooting of nine Black people at a church in Charleston, South Carolina. The shooter wanted to start a revolution of hate and a small group of people in Exeter decided to start a revolution of love. Our mission is to advance relationships among people of different racial identities, increasing understanding and reducing bias in our community. Out of this mission, we create programs that will foster communication and awareness for various topics that impact our community. Today, in the first session of this series, we discuss standing in solidarity, seeing in color, colorism and the lessons of early activism. I would like to give a thank you to our grantors, New Hampshire Humanities and Kennebunk Savings. I also want to give a thank you to SAU 16 for their support in this program. Um, we want to lastly thank our presenters for joining us on this panel and a special thank you to the Racial Unity Team Board Chair for organizing this amazing series. Just a few Zoom rules for today. We are recording this program so that we can post this event to our webpage for others to view. If you would not like your face to be visible, please turn off the video for your Zoom. Please make sure your mics remain muted during this discussion. Please be mindful of others. There's a large amount of individuals in this Zoom. Um, background noise will interrupt the speaker. We will be using the chat function of the Zoom. So we ask if you have any questions or comments to put them into the chat. We ask that you do not interrupt the speaker. We will try to get to all of your questions um, at the end of the presentation. If you need to leave this panel early, please feel free to do so without interrupting. So I would now like to introduce our moderator for this series, Cabria Baumgartner. She is an associate professor of English and American studies at the University of New Hampshire. She is the author of the award-winning book, In Pursuit of Knowledge, Black Women in Educational Activism in Antebellum America which tells the story of African-American girls and women who fought to democratize public and private schools in the 19th century Northeast. She is currently writing a biography of Robert Morris, one of the first African-American lawyers in the United States. Cabria, let's turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Tanisha, for that introduction. Um, good morning and welcome to all of you for joining us. Um, I'm delighted to be here to open this symposium, which, as Tanisha said, will feature three exciting talks on colorism. Before I introduce Professor Bell, I first want to provide us with a working definition of colorism to frame Professor Bell's talk and subsequent ones. And I'll also type the definition in the chat so we can refer back to it. And then second, I would like us to think about how colorism relates to racism. So two black women have given us a wonderful starting point for uh, these definitions. First is um, African-American novelist and activist, Alice Walker. And then the second is black actor, filmmaker and author, Lupita Nyong'o. In an essay from her book entitled In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, which was published in 1983, Alice Walker defines colorism as, quote, prejudicial or preferential treatment of the same race of people based solely on their color. And here she means skin color. Walker goes on to add, um, that oftentimes this means privileging light skin over dark skin. And so colorism is not unique to the United States at all. It's really a global problem um, seen within ethnic groups across East and Southeast Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, and so on. If we think about it, um, maybe in, in my talk next week, I might um, show you some of the advertisements for skin lightening creams 
um, in, in Southeast Asia. So race matters um, and so does color. Lupita Nyong'o said um, about colorism and how it relates to racism. She said, colorism is the daughter of racism in a world that rewards lighter skin over darker skin. And so Lupita um, said this in various um, interviews, right? She is a dark skinned woman, has described her own experiences growing up um, and later navigating Hollywood. Um, and I believe she's from Kenya and she grew up part, part of, um, of her childhood in, in Mexico. So she talks about that experience, but also then what it means to be a dark skinned woman in Hollywood right, um, fighting for roles. And that inspired her to write the children's book, Solway, about a dark-skinned girl who learns to love herself. Um, and so that's one of the books that I highly recommend that we read to our children. So let's keep these remarks in mind from Walker and Nyong'o as we listen to Professor John Frederick Bell's talk this morning. Professor Bell is an assistant professor of history at Assumption University in Worcester, Massachusetts. Previously, he was a Spencer Dissertation Fellow at the National Academy of Education, a Kilachand Postdoctoral Fellow at Boston University, and a visiting lecturer at Brown University. He received his PhD in American Studies from Harvard University in 2017. Prior to pursuing graduate study, he worked as a declassification analyst at the National Archives and as a high school social studies teacher. His research examines the intersecting histories of race, education, and social reform in 19th century America. His scholarly articles and reviews have appeared in the Journal of the Early Republic, the History of Education Quarterly, the Journal of the Civil War Era, among others. His forthcoming book is entitled The Abolitionist Colleges, Dreams of Racial Equality Deferred, and that will be published by Louisiana State University Press. So please join me in a virtual round of applause to welcome Professor Bell. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriel, for that introduction. And thank you all um, so much for being here. Uh, I had seriously hoped to be joining you all in, in Exeter and have a nice road trip this morning. But of course, um, things work out differently sometimes. So we're going to make the best of it. Uh, and it's good to see you guys regardless. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to thank uh, Ken and Tanisha and Sophie for uh, inviting me to participate in this series and for putting this on. Uh, and of course, all of you for for being here this morning, and I hope uh, to see you again for the subsequent sessions. Um, I think uh, I, I really appreciate that this symposium is specifically on colorism. I think it's an aspect of racism that we hear uh, less about, uh, but is no less present in the lives of people of color, uh, as Dr. Baumgartner mentioned, not just uh, in the United States, but around the world. Um, like many white people, I grew up avoiding any talk of race. Um, and uh, if talking about race was taboo, then talking about skin color was completely beyond the pale. Um, I uh, said the word black with apprehension for a very long time. Uh, but in the time since, I've come to realize that denying seeing color or avoiding talking about color has a way of perpetuating colorism, the way that avoiding seeing race or, not, or avoiding talking about race uh, can perpetuate racism. So I want to talk this morning about how we can uh, get past that and talk about some constructive ways, constructive lessons from history uh, in order to um, think about how we can start to dismantle ideas of colorism and then in turn uh, racism as well. And I really admire the work of the racial unity team and you all deserve credit for, uh, for engaging in this work. So um, shout out to you. I'm going to share my screen uh, and uh, walk you through a little PowerPoint as we as we do this. So if you'll bear with me for one moment. Okay, hope you can all see that. So I'm a historian, uh, guilty as charged, which means that uh, for me, the first step toward uh, dismantling systems of oppression is to understand their history. And I think the same is true of, 
of colorism. Um, so I'm going to spend a, a, the opening portion of my talk trying to kind of unpack the history of this concept in the United States uh, and then talk about some specific examples from our research on how it's affected the lives in particular of uh, students of color. Um, the historical association of dark skin with deficiency or with degradation uh, is not just a historical phenomenon. It continues to affect people of color uh, in the United States, particularly black Americans. Uh, today, black men with darker skin are more likely to be victims of police violence than black men with lighter skin. We know that uh, juries are more likely to convict black defendants with darker skin, that African Americans with darker skin are less likely to hold elected office than African Americans with lighter skin, and that black children with darker skin are more likely to be disciplined in school than their counterparts. And by the way, the same is true of uh, brown children with darker skin. So why this uh, special prejudice against complexion? Where did colorism come from? I think many of us are familiar with the one drop rule. Um, so this is the colonial era concept uh, that created a caste division between uh, black and white. Um, this term caste has been used most recently in a book by, um, um, oh my gosh, now I'm blanking on her name. Uh, uh, an author wrote a recent book about caste, which actually talks about race as a caste system in the United States. I think it's helpful to think about it uh, in those terms. So the one drop rule created this caste division between black and white, a color line uh, in order to make as many people as possible eligible for enslavement and for subjugation. Um, that uh, color line was important, but at the same time, there was a color spectrum in effect. And this is the part that we talk less about, but is, uh, I think, no less important. So uh, people's place on the color spectrum could influence their experience of enslavement, uh, and it could also influence uh, free black people's lives in key ways. So I want to take a moment and talk about that to start. Um, enslaved people with lighter skin were considered more capable because of their white ancestry. So uh, this meant that they were more eligible for things like housework, sometimes even for literacy, uh, although that became uh, made illegal after, after a time. Uh, lighter skinned women were also uh, sometimes subject to sex slavery. This is called a fancy made trade. So it's one of the, um, one of the darker uh, aspects of an already uh, dark and demonic institution was um, this trade in um, sexual slavery, which, uh, which light skinned women were made a part of. Um, darker skinned enslaved people were more likely to be relegated to field work. Um, supposedly their pure African ancestry made them better suited to hard labor in the eyes of so many slaveholders. So this was a, an important phenomenon uh, amongst, uh, well, within the, the institution of slavery, and it was a, a daily reality for enslaved people uh, that their skin color would govern uh, their treatment. Um, but this was also a persistent reality amongst free people of color um, in the North. Um, those with lighter skin, studies have shown, experience greater economic mobility in the antebellum period, higher occupational status, uh, higher uh, educational attainment than free African Americans with darker skin. Now, black abolitionists and reformers, uh, of course, they were committed to ending slavery, but they also wanted to undo the, the mental association in white people's minds of dark skin with deficiency or the association of dark skin with degradation. So they, uh, these reformers hoped that um, through displays of respectability, through displays of their own personal refinement, um, they could build support for universal emancipation and for civil rights um, by showing that African Americans were equally capable of uh, full citizenship. Education was a key aspect in this movement for respectability. Uh, academic achievement was believed to show uh, how the ways in which complexion did not constrain uh, black people's potential. And uh, if you want a great a book on this, I would highly recommend Dr. Baumgartner's book, uh, excellent study of, um, of black women in particular and their uh, pursuits of knowledge. Now, uh, when whites joined the cause of immediate abolition in the 1830s, um, some began founding interracial schools uh, in an effort to uh, promote this idea of black advancement while also showcasing the possibilities of racial pluralism. And I wanted to take a moment and uh, note that one of these schools was in New Hampshire, where many of you are this morning. Uh, so uh, the Noise Academy, short-lived Noise Academy in Canaan, New Hampshire, near Hanover, 
uh, was one of these integrated institutions, and we can talk about its history in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, here's a painting depicting its demolition. Um, so the goal of these institutions, as I said, was to promote ideas of racial pluralism. Uh, and in order to promote those ideas, in order to try to undo, like I said, this, this association of dark skin with deficiency, these school leaders had a way of uh, invoking diversity of color as well as diversity of race amongst their students. So the idea was that a broad array of skin tones uh, amongst the student body would um, signal the progress, the progress that these institutions were making toward eradicating social hierarchies based on color. And since colorism occupied, uh, or sorry, operated on a sliding scale, the achievements of darker skinned students were considered to be especially effective rebuttals to colorism. Now, there was a problem with this, uh, this line of argument that became apparent um, pretty quickly, and that was that using color as a counter argument to prejudice could sometimes be counterproductive. So in their rush to stand in solidarity uh, with black students, uh, so often white abolitionist college leaders could overcompensate uh, by patronizing students of color or making them into mascots for their college's campaigns against caste. And meanwhile, white students who were unaccustomed to interacting with African Americans as equals uh, harassed their classmates, their darker skinned classmates as much or more than they did other students of color. So uh, as a historian, I was interested in learning more about the experiences in particular of these uh, darker skinned black students at abolitionist colleges. And in a recent article, I look at uh, those experiences at two institutions, uh, one which may be a familiar name to folks, uh, Oberlin College in Ohio, um, another at a defunct uh, college in upstate New York, it was called New York Central College near uh, Cortland, New York. And what I found in this research was that um, students with ebony skin were, uh, you might say, a double minority on campus. This meant that, well, first of all, the vast majority of their classmates at both institutions were white. And then of the students of color who made up somewhere between two and 10% of the student body, most were light skinned. Most of the students of color who attended these abolitionist colleges uh, were either the children of free northerners or in fact, uh, the children of white slaveholders who sent them north to be uh, free and educated. So having darker skin at an institution like this made these students especially vulnerable to harassment, uh, both on campus and off campus. So for instance, they were met with racial slurs aimed specifically at their color. Uh, so the repeated use, for instance, of the epithet darky to describe, um, to describe them. Uh, one of the students that I study was uh, suspected of being a runaway slave simply because of his dark skin, uh, even though he was a free person. Uh, another was accused of trying to elope with a white woman um, again, based solely on uh, his skin color, and he was effectively kept under house arrest for a period of time, um, extra legally. These students uh, encountered prejudices, these sorts of prejudices, but they also encountered the condescension and paternalism of, uh, of school leaders. So uh, college officials, as I mentioned before, sometimes were over eager to protect these students from prejudice and sometimes uh, had a way of intervening on their behalf in a sort of paternalistic way. So just as a, for instance, uh, Oberlin's president uh, interrupted a program of speeches in which one of these students, a student named Sabrum was speaking in order to vouch for the character in order to vouch for this student's character. So to say, this, this guy is, uh, is well suited to be speaking to you today. He's a, uh, a young man of, of great character and deportment um, that even at the time people said well shouldn't you let him speak for himself it's a bit unnecessary for you to interject like this I think he's doing a good enough job on his own uh, but this was a tendency amongst uh, white uh, abolitionists this kind of knee-jerk reaction or a tendency to overcompensate in this way um, in a separate instance a student named Mahoma um, it's a drawing of him uh, at Central College uh, was in a class and his, his teacher actually wrote a poem for him to read uh, in front of his classmates. And I think I'll read a few lines of this poem and you can see kind of how galling this paternalistic aspect could be. Um, the poem included these lines. This is beyond paternalism, really. Uh, you can't expect one of my race with woolly hair and sable face and scarce array of knowledge to interest his friends at college. Um, 
so here's, a, here's an example of a white person sort of ventriloquizing uh, for uh, her black student and in ways that aren't letting him speak for himself. So these incidents, even though the institutions themselves were committed to ending colorism and racism, these incidents had a way of reinforcing that same phenomenon by uh, reinforcing the association between dark skin and some kind of deficiency or inadequacy, um, suggesting these black students could not somehow speak for themselves. What's interesting to me though, is the way in which these students uh, responded to the harassment and to the condescension that they encountered. So how did they, uh, how were they actors in this story? Um, in the face of this treatment, they found ways to assert their respectability and assert their own racial pride. Uh, so Sabrum, for instance, used his knowledge of parliamentary procedure to actually deliver a comeuppance to Oberlin's president at the end of his speech, the speech that had been interrupted. Uh, Mahoma, the student pictured here, uh, who was made to read the poem, went on to use the writing skills that he'd gained from that same class to secure a missionary position and to leave uh, his, uh, his college. Um, both of those students that I mentioned went on to become outspoken advocates of uh, Black empowerment thereafter. Uh, Mahoma published this autobiography in 1854, uh, recounting his escape from slavery and then uh, just detailing the prejudice that he, he encountered in this uh, so-called free north. Um, he eventually moved to Canada and then to England to pursue his missionary work. Sabrum, the other student I mentioned, became the, one of the uh, Oberlin Black community's representatives at national African-American political conventions, and he was even elected to local office in Oberlin after the Civil War. So uh, these two men's stories, I think, show us the ways in which deep-seated bias against blackness itself made it hard or harder for darker skinned African Americans to gain the respect that they deserve. Um, but when we think about how to apply their life histories to tackle the problem of colorism today, I think what's most notable is the way that they use pride to challenge bigotry. So in order to disrupt these associations of inferiority uh, with dark skin and to challenge the logic of colorism, uh, they reclaim the greatness of blackness itself. So they, they're challenging uh, the sort of central, uh, central argument of colorism by reclaiming that, uh, that idea. Um, I think we are all familiar with this slogan uh, made popular in the 1970s, uh, in part by the Black Power Movement, in part by the uh, Stephen Biko's anti-apartheid movement, uh, in South Africa. Um, this is actually a, a German ad, I think, uh, but the, the sentiment is, is familiar to us. Um, but that same sentiment, actually, we associate it with the 1970s, but actually it originates in the 1850s. Uh, so uh, historians trace this, this not ex the exact words, but the idea uh, to a speech by a black abolitionist named uh, John S. Rock, who, uh, like Sabrum and Mahoma, had dark skin. Rock was both a dentist and an attorney, try and beat that. Uh, and he was the first African-American uh, admitted to practice before the US Supreme Court before his uh, untimely death in 1866. He gave a speech at Faneuil Hall in 1858. Uh, and in this speech, which was in response to the, the Dred Scott decision, which said that African-Americans were ineligible for citizenship, uh, Rock uh, expressed his solidarity with, uh, with, his, with his race, but he also took on the issue of colorism directly. And I'd like to read an excerpt of that address. And this is sort of like supposedly the speech that's the origin of this term or this idea anyway, of black is beautiful. Rock said, it's a great speech by the way, we should read the whole thing, but this is just an excerpt. Uh, the prejudice which some white men have or affect to have against my color gives me no pain. If any man does not fancy my color, that is his business. I shall give myself no trouble because he lacks good taste. If he judges my intellectual capacity to, if he judges my intellectual capacity by my color, he certainly cannot expect much profundity for it is only skin deep and is really of no, no very great importance to anyone but myself. I would have you understand that I not only love my race, but am pleased with my color. So you can see how he is, uh, he is challenging directly this idea of, uh, of dark skin representing some kind of inadequacy by reclaiming uh, its, uh, its beauty and taking pride uh, in that, in his own color as well as in his race. So I think uh, Rock's words and along with the lessons, the examples of students that I mentioned like Mahoma and Sabrum, these uh, stories I think offer lessons 
uh, in the fight against colorism today. Um, you know, I think advocates of racial justice and racial unity like this organization, um, all of us involved in this work need to find ways of celebrating blackness without patronizing black people. No one should be uh, made to compensate for the skin color that God gave them uh, or to apologize for it, let alone suffer for it. We can discuss many strategies, perhaps in the Q&A, for dismantling color prejudice from expanding opportunity to improving representation to increasing dialogue. But I think for these approaches to work, history shows us that Black people must be empowered to fully participate and to lead. I think that given an equal voice, their gifts and talents will more than speak for themselves as they always have. So thank you for this opportunity to share some, um, some basic thoughts with you from my research. And I'm very excited to hear your uh, questions and comments and take part in this conversation. Wonderful, thank you so much, John, for that compelling presentation. And really for historicizing for us where some of these ideas um, originated. I know that we might have questions about uh, the one drop rule. There might be questions um, about Oberlin College and, and some of those darker skinned students who, who attended. Um, so I do have a few questions, but I'll hold off for now um, to see if there are questions that pop into the chat. Gabriel, no questions right now in the chat. So if you want to start with yours and then we can go from there. Okay. So um, I'm not sure if um, people are familiar with um, a recent to do in academia, a big scandal involving um, a young white Jewish woman who pretended to be black. Um, her name is Jessica Krug. I think the New York Times even covered it. Um, it's a pretty big scandal in part because she sort of made her career on um, identifying as black. Um, as she identified different kinds of blackness, so it was very diasporic. At one point she identified as North African, then she identified as Caribbean, and then um, as a black Puerto Rican. Um, but it was a pretty big scandal in academia, and really there are a lot of debates if you're on Twitter, so you follow the Twitter story, and um, there is a, a big to-do about it because it sort of bumps up against this idea of colorism. Part of the reason why she could quote unquote pass as black is because of her fair skin, right? Um, and quite frankly, there were some people who were like who doubted her, who maybe even challenged her, but nothing really came of it because if someone says they're black, especially in the black community, where we think of blackness as being somewhat capacious, um, it, we don't we don't doubt it, right? You, it would be very um, cruel in some ways to doubt somebody's blackness. Um, so, uh, Professor Bell, given sort of what you've described here, sort of historicizing colorism for us, I'm just curious on your thoughts on um, that scandal uh, and what it might say about um, colorism. Yeah, it's a great point, and it's a story that that I've certainly followed. There was a there was an excellent editorial about it in the Washington Post by one of their commentators, whose whose name I'm forgetting, but it's one that maybe we could look up and share. Um, looking at that that story from a, in the late from the lens of someone who who studies um, critical race theory. Um, yeah, the Krug case, of course, it brought to mind that earlier uh, case of um, Rachel um, starts with a D, Dola Dola Jala, maybe. Um, and another uh, white woman who, who um, posed as black and in, in her case had a leadership role in a, I think a Washington state uh, NAACP organization. Um, the idea of racial passing uh, is a longstanding one uh, and it's uh, one that um, you know, colorism has facilitated. Typically we think of passing moving in the opposite direction, right? So uh, people of, with black ancestry passing as white. Um, but it's, there's actually a fairly long history too, albeit lesser known, of uh, white people passing as black for a variety of reasons. Um, the, uh, this particular case um, suggests that, uh, that there is a, um, well, it, it, I think it brings to light the most pernicious aspect of colorism, which are these uh, 
if, if the color line, like I mentioned before, that separates black and white creates privileges for uh, people of white ancestry, then this colorism aspect creates uh, another set of privileges for lighter skinned people. And Krug's choice um, was taking advantage, I think, of both of those things. So it's been described as an act of whiteness or even white supremacy, and that's also playing on uh, the advantages, um, sadly, that, that lighter skinned um, people of color could have. Um, so it's doubly upsetting, I think, in that regard. Um, and it's a sad commentary on, um, on I, you know, the, well, it's, it's hard for me to understand what would, what would bring a person uh, to that point. Um, but I think that the, um, it's, in essence, it's a, it's a, um, it's a perversion of empathy, I think. Uh, so there is, I think people, of different racial backgrounds, and it seems to be a premise of this organization, have the capacity to, to sympathize and empathize with uh, people who have lived different lives than themselves. And that's an important part of living in a pluralistic society. I think it's a vital part of living in a pluralistic society uh, and doing the work of, of racial unity and racial justice. But, um, but to go to that extent suggests that uh, that's not really about empathy anymore. It's, it's more about, um, uh, about appropriation, which is, uh, which is something that, um, that's, that's uh, kind of contrary to, I think, to the, to the values that, uh, of racial pluralism. So um, that's, uh, yeah, I think there's gonna be more to be said about this, probably more to be written about her case too, but it is a reminder that these factors and these forces are still very much present. Right. I think, the, yeah, that last point I, I really wanna echo. Um, so we, we have to realize that colorism is something, right, that is part and parcel of um, not just the United States, but other, countries, but we see it play out in these kinds of incidents. Um, and that there's actually real harm that's done, um, in part because Jessica is a particular individual, um, was really combative um, when interacting with Black people. Um, and so she was, you know, she was kind of pretty radical in, in some of her views, um, which is fine. But other Black people with, with whom she met and talked to, she would um, call them out for not being as radical as, as she was. Um, and so there are, you know, these are some of the, the issues that come up when we think about um, colorism, right? It's not something that just um, is part of the, part of the past. Um, I see there are some questions in the chat, so I will let um, uh, Tanisha ask. So those. the first question was, where can we get John Rock's full speech? Do we have a link that maybe we can post? I'd be happy to look one up. Yep. Uh, the speech is called, I Will Sink or Swim. So you could uh, we, you could Google it if you're quicker at the Googling than I am, uh, but um, I can also look it up as well. I know it's available for sure. Thank you. 1858. Uh, yep. Second question. Why, if people were promoting the intrinsic value of people with dark skin, why do we still have this problem today? Boy, I think that could be a question for the whole group. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I can also take a stab at that one too, if you want. Yeah. Oh uh, boy. Uh, you know, I, I think some of it is just a, is a willful uh, ignorance or avoidance of the issue itself, which is the same reason why racism is still around, uh, or one of the same reasons why racism is still around. Um, that there is a, a, a great reluctance to confront this problem, at least, um, you know, either, either a reluctance or a, um, uh, yeah, I think a reluctance is a word word for it, or as I said, a willful ignorance to uh, to address these issues. And some of that, I think, is changing. It's becoming more, as I said, sort of my preliminary comments here. You know, growing up, um, I'll just tell you a quick story. So when I was a, a high school teacher, this is right after college, and um, uh, again, I was still in this mode where we we don't talk about race and we certainly don't talk about color. But it was a predominantly black school, so this is. Uh, this is a this is a fact of life for my students, and it didn't face them at all. Um, and why should it? Um, and one of the students asked me uh, if um, if he could get a pass to go see uh, Miss Williams. And there were two Miss Williams at the school, both of them black women. And uh, and he and I said, well, which Miss Williams? And he said, uh, the light skinned Miss Williams. And I was completely taken aback by this. And I of course I didn't even want to accept it. I said, oh, you mean the light the the Miss Williams who teaches art history or whatever it was, art or English or something. I didn't want to like even like acknowledge that this was uh, that this was out there. Um, so I think some of it is that uh, is a a greater willingness to engage in these conversations because they are lived realities for uh, people of color and uh, and it's just 
uh, oftentimes I think, at least speaking from my own experience, it was just a, an avoidance or a dis avoidance of discomfort that led me to uh, not take up this question. Um, but I think that part of it is, is like so many of these issues of racial justice is a, is a, uh, a lack of self-education, um, which has got to be the first step. But I'd be excited to hear um, Capria's thoughts on this too. Yeah, so I was thinking about, um, especially because some of some of the conversations around um, Jessica Krug, there were um, a couple of people who were talking about how all of this sort of falls under the umbrella of white supremacy. Um, that because of the dominance and power associated with whiteness, which again is not just unique to the United States, it's global. Um, that's, part, that's partly why um, colorism can continue, can, can continue to exist because racism still exists. And really, uh, some people are saying the people who win here are those who believe in white supremacy. Because the idea is that the closer you get to whiteness, the more accepted you are, the more valued you are, the greater benefits you receive. Um, and so part of the reason why maybe colorism exists still is the same reason as you were saying, um, Professor Bell, is the reason why racism still exists. Right, um, there are our winners, and and there are those who do not win. Um, and I, so I've I've personally experienced this as a darker skinned woman, um, and I've seen it sort of play out. And you know, I, I think it's really, as you were saying, it's really insidious. Um, it's I find it to be violent, right? Um, especially in terms of sort of what it does to one's psyche. I'll be talking more about this next week, so I don't want to get into it too much, but um, I'll be talking about Toni Morrison's um, The Bluest Eye, right? And sort of what it means to, to be a dark-skinned girl um, and, to have, and to live in a world that may not value that. Um, so I'll say more next week, but yeah. Thank you. We have Sarah who wants to ask a question. So I'm going to have Sarah, if you can unmute yourself um, just to ask your question. Hi, thank you so much. So um, I, I feel like this is going to come across the wrong way and I'm, I'm not a scholar by any means, um, but you brought up an interesting point and I think as a co-redhead, you can appreciate that sometimes um, we're picked out in a room or described like, oh, well, it's the redhead or it's, and no, it's not. I am not in any way equating that to um, what we're discussing here today, but it just, you know, we, I, I also don't want to ignore the fact that when we are, we have to describe people, right? Um, and no, we don't want to use skin or color or race as a descriptor. Um, I grew up my father's a professor at Hampton University. I grew up with people from all over the world in my house, and um, I love diversity more than anything. It's what I do for my work. Um, but I'm just wondering at what point, like, is there any, I don't know if I can even get my question out. Is there any level of, I don't want to say acceptance, but I, I don't think I can even ask the question, but I think you can understand what I'm trying to say is that we do use what we see as ways to describe people, whether it's long hair, glasses, um, the buck teeth, the, you know, whatever. Um, and I was just kind of curious about that or just wanted to, maybe it's not even a question, but I guess that's something that I wrestle with um, and certainly don't use it for myself, but can you know, when we're thinking about children and what they're experiencing or how they, a student can get that point across that, um, I just think it's an interesting aspect or conversation of this topic. Yeah, thanks for sharing that perspective. I, I think that, and that's sort of, it's a version of what I was trying to get at with that, that anecdote from my high school teaching days is that there are times when describing a person's color is irrelevant. Like. I ran into, I, I had a conversation with a woman at the store and she told me to make sure I watch like the Super Bowl tonight. If you don't need to, I don't think it's necessary to say I had a conversation with a black woman at the store and she told me to watch the Super Bowl tonight. But you hear people say that, or at least as a white person, I hear other white people say that. Um, and they don't say that when they're talking about other white people as a rule. Um, however, I had a conversation with a black woman, we talked about race. That's obviously that's, that reflects on like what might actually come out in that conversation. Or in my case, like, it's okay to say that, like, if we're trying to dis dis describe people, like, those people know that their own skin color. That's part of what I was sort of pretending as if they didn't. 
Uh, but uh, but make that distinction, I think, is important. And yeah, there are there are many times when it is important to talk about race and color, and we avoid it. And there are other times when it is not important to talk about it, and we invoke it. Uh, at least as white people, we do. So what is that about? Uh, and I think that's part of kind of investigating our own uh, privilege and our own uh, whiteness is to understand why it is that we we feel like that's a a necessary descriptor, or why we avoid that descriptor in other occasions. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just add um, that sometimes, yeah, it is a necessary descriptor um, or one would like to provide that description, right? Um, maybe those details, but it's also about the values and perceptions we attach to it. So if I want to say, oh, there's this novel about a dark skinned girl, that's fine, right? And I can talk about it. But if I'm going to start sort of, you know, um, using my value judgments to say, well, that girl was bad, that girl was rude, right? then that's when it's, um, it's problematic. And I think as John said in the beginning of his presentation, we have examples of darker skin um, men and women who get, um, I guess, more, more severely punished in a variety of environments, not just with the police, but in the court system and in schools. So darker skin girls are more likely to be punished, uh, um, expelled, suspended and expelled compared to lighter skin and sort of uh, white girls. So it's those kinds of value judgments. Once we start thinking about it systematically, that I think it becomes a really big problem. So we have another question. Um, I'm trying to go in order here. What historical role has America played in exporting colorism to the world? and why? The question is, I think, do we believe that America exported it? Or Ooh, is it, I, I don't know, what do you think? Professor? Uh, well, I think, you know, Dr. Baumgartner mentioned that this is like a, is a global phenomenon and appears in different societies. I, I mentioned caste before. Um, and uh, the book, book, by the way, I'm trying to think about is by Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote a fantastic book about the Great Migration also. Um, but her new book is about caste. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously when we think of caste, our first, uh, first recollection is of the caste system in India. That doesn't always have color implications, but sometimes it does. Um, we could talk about the Sistema de Castas, which was active in Spanish America, uh, whereby they created I had a slide about this in my presentation originally, but you, you could easily look it up. These, these very specific designations based on a person's parentage and then also in turn based on their skin color. So was a person purely Spanish of ancestry where they half native and half Spanish and so on. And that created this, this hierarchy that would, um, that's, not a, that's not a one drop rule because it's, it's, a, it's a spectrum, um, but it was in the same way, you know, a system of differentiation. Um, so this tendency is not um, unique to the United States, but I would say that like, um, like race, as a, just as a concept, it's a product of modernity uh, and a product of the Atlantic exchange in particular um, and of just imperialism and colonialism. So it wasn't until, I mean, there's not even a notion that there is such a thing as a black person until, uh, you know, the 17th century, essentially. Um, before that, you know, people belonged to different African tribes, the same way that there wasn't a con conception of a Native American uh, before other people arrived in this, these continents and this hemisphere, right? People belong to their own uh, tribes, clans, and so on. So, uh, so this is like a, a the in exchange of people's ideas and then also of uh, violence and um, slavery and things like that, I think creates these, this te tendency to categorize and to, uh, to order uh, and to create these hierarchies. And so uh, that might explain the sort of global reach of it. So it's not unique to the United States. Although, you know, in more present context, we could talk about, you know, the, the power of the American entertainment industry and the decisions that are made there have global ramifications and have for what, 70 years now. Uh, so those, uh, those decisions have a way of replicating racial norms, even in, in completely different contexts, I think. So it's an important phenomenon to think about too, when we talk about the representation of different groups of people in the media and film and television and so on. So we have another thought and question. Is the use of quote unquote darkness to describe biblical sin in the US's dominant faith Christianity something that should or can be addressed in this topic? We often use dark to describe quote unquote scary as well. Does this have an impact and how do we work with that? And 
is this person being oversensitive? The, the historian uh, Winthrop Jordan wrote a great book called White Over Black, and he spends a, uh, some portion of it talking about this association of blackness with sin. And it's something that actually even these reformers that I mentioned in my talk meant, talk about. So when they describe one of the students' skin color, they say uh, he was black as a slaveholder's heart which is a really bizarre formulation and descriptor, but they meant that association with sin, but of course then they're also associated with color. So again, color becomes this marker somehow of, of uh, degradation or even sinfulness um, because of this medieval association of, of blackness with sin. Um, so there's been, there's been a lot um, written about it and um, I'm sure Dr. Baumgartner could, could offer some, some uh, suggestions for readings and other things on this topic too. Um, but uh, you know, there's there are examples of uh, people with a variety of skin tones in the Bible itself. So we could help undo that. I think of the verse, uh, "For the darkness and the light are both alike to you," um, which is a reminder that, um, as I kind of mentioned in the talk, there, uh, it's not that. Well, this is just speaking from my own religious perspective. I guess I don't think that it's God doesn't. Uh, uh, I don't think that it's that God doesn't see color. It's that God embraces or embodies all colors. Um, the book, The Color of Water, the memoir, um, outstanding memoir. I'm forgetting every author's name today. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he asked his mother, so he's the guy whose mother was um, white and his father was black. Uh, he asked uh, his mother, what color is God? And, he, and the response is, God is the color of water. Uh, so this, this helps us think past, I think, some of these, um, these kind of basic assumptions about, um, uh, about darkness and sin. The other reading that I was thinking about uh, that's absolutely worth it, not just for this context, but in any context is the autobiography of Malcolm X, uh, in which he talks a lot about realizing that, that this is, a, this is uh, something that's inhibited Black people for a long time. So it's, a, it's an important thing to, to bring up, I think. Thank you. We have two similar questions on um, the social experiments with young children and dolls that chose the black doll um, or seen the black doll as bad, ugly, and the white doll as good, as well as the British experiments in the 50s and 60s comparing um, self-perceptions of blue-eyed children versus brown-eyed children. How does these two things interface with the colorism issue? Um, and as well as how do we think um, young children obtain these impressions? I know we have the, the third session that really talks about the children and toys um, discussion, but just to set a light on this question, if we want to do a brief snippet and then point us to the third session. <laughs> I'm smiling because, you know, we have one of the countries like foremost experts on this topic talking in a couple weeks. Uh, so I feel extremely presumptuous saying anything at all. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Baumgartner. What do you think? Yeah, so I, I'm, I guess this is a good time to plug that session. Um, that'll be October 3rd with Dr. Arya Halliday. Um, and she'll be, the title of her, her talk is Beauty and the Beholder, Colorism and the Lessons We Teach Our Children. Um, and she is an expert in African American popular culture and American popular culture. And so she is going to historicize for us the, the doll test. Um, she's going to talk about that, um, the types of dolls that were um, invented, especially during the Black is Beautiful era, as, as Professor Bell mentioned, um, of the 70s. And um, I think she's also going to um, yeah, give us some lessons on um, how we can especially teach um, lighter skin and white children um, sort of the beauty that is in all colors, all skin colors. Um, so she's going to have some recommendations along those lines. Thank you. And we'll do our last question. Uh, there was a question of why was the noise, the noise academy destroyed? Uh, yeah, so as I, as I showed in that, that uh, painting, um, the, the institution encountered almost immediate uh, public disdain and hostility and antagonism uh, because they dared to bring together students of different races on terms of equality. Um, this was seen as a outright threat to white supremacy and it was something that um, 
uh, that the local people of Canaan, New Hampshire could not countenance. So they uh, literally tore the school down with all those oxen that you saw tied to the school. I can't remember quite how many, um, but pulled the school off its foundation. Um, so it's, I mean, there's like symbolic and also, um, you know, very literal implications there, but um, it meant that students, uh, you know, these students, uh, partic I mean, this was a, an integrated school, primarily white students, but the black students who had traveled for long distances to get to Canaan, New Hampshire, which is, um, you know, not that conveniently located, uh, were forced to, to go elsewhere for their education. Some of these students had already been turned away from other institutions. Dr. Baumgartner has written uh, about the um, Canterbury Seminary in, in um, uh, in Connecticut, uh, where um, a similar phenomenon happened to a, a white teacher named Prudence Crandall. Um, so this was something of a phenomenon in, in this period of, uh, of either attempts at creating integrated schools that failed because of local uh, violence, um, or um, you know that schools would get started and then be forced to shut down and people being prosecuted and stuff like that for violating all sorts of things. Dr. Baumgartner could say more for sure about the Canterbury example. Um, the only reason that the institutions that I write about were able to survive, like, um, sorry, my daughter's crying in the background. I don't know if anybody can hear that. Uh, the only reasons that institutions like Oberlin or New York Central could survive uh, was because they were located in these very small and kind of isolated communities. So the Oberlin community was started as, as what they called a colony. So it was made up of like-minded people. Um, but when these kinds of schools tried to start, for instance, in New Haven, Connecticut, a uh, black college was attempted to be started there in, I think, 1833, four. Um, it was immediately um, uh, shut down, basically, right before it could even get started. So that was a, a common thing to have happen. And uh, it was yet yeah, just another impediment to black people being uh, receiving equal education. So. Thank you. Um, I did miss one question in the chat and I apologize. The question was, has South Africa moved past colorism? So I, I'll take a stab at this. Um, I'm not a historian of uh, South Africa, so um, I don't have expertise in that area. I will say, um, so I traveled to South Africa maybe maybe it's 10 years ago now. Um, and I was very struck by what I saw. Um, to me, there's still very much um, a color caste system in South Africa. Um, those who are lighter skin, uh, just again, this is anecdotal, just my perception and experience at traveling there for a couple of weeks. Uh, I was in Johannesburg, Cape Town, um, Gons Bay, um, and a couple of other places. And it, there's still very much um, sort of the value, a higher value attached to people who are lighter skinned, um, particularly people who are lighter skinned and mixed race. Um, I, I would say that some of them are um, I, identifiable. So if you think about advertisements, all that media, uh, Professor Bell mentioned, mentioned this, all that coming at you, it's mostly lighter skinned, um, you know, black people or lighter skinned mixed race people. So in my perception, yes, it's still a problem in South Africa. If I think about what they call shanty towns, um, I was always very struck by the fact that they seem to surround highways um, and the, the beautiful sprawling properties are owned by white people um, that, have, that overlook the ocean, right? That overlook water. They're gorgeous properties. You get, you get a, a, a contrast of um, the wealth inequality, right? Of the system of apartheid. Um, which is still in the landscape. So you have the shanty towns and in, in those towns, oftentimes the vast majority of people are dark skinned. So, you know, this is just a perception, I'm not a historian, but this is just what I saw. And I went during World Cup. Um, and so there was an even more concerted effort to show a new South Africa. Um, and I didn't, I didn't see much that was that new. I think this, the, the government is trying to take steps um, to, to bring about more racial equity and equality, but it's still a really stark contrast. And I also thought, for, you know, I said, well, how different is a place like Johannesburg and Cape Town from a place like Detroit or parts of Southern, you know, Los Angeles or other, um, you know, big cities? Would we see similar kinds of colorism and racism playing out? And quite frankly, yeah. So I don't want to say like South Africa's by we're doing such great things in the U.S. You you see it in mapped in the in the cities and the landscape. Um, so I think yeah, there's more work to be done. Um, an interesting comparison we can do between South Africa and the U.S. 
Thank you. I'm going to turn this over to Sophie to just kind of give us a recap um, and bring it on home. Great. Thanks, Tanisha. Um, we've learned a lot today, a lot of really awesome information. So I'm going to give kind of a recap. Um, Dr. Baumgartner opened up with some quotes um, from Alice Walker, who defined colorism as prejudicial or preferential treatment of same race people based solely on their skin color. Um, this is a global problem. It's not specific to the US, as we just heard about South Africa. It's kind of everywhere. Um, Lupita Nongo has a quote that colorism is the daughter of racism in a world that rewards lighter skin over darker skin. And I'm gonna post a bunch of links here in the chat to books that were mentioned over the course of the chat and links to purchase them if you're interested in doing so. Um, and then we heard from, is it Dr. Bell? I'm going to say, assuming Dr. Bell, cool. And then we heard from Dr. Bell that um, kind of earlier in his career, he had difficulty talking about racism um, when in high school and not, and not really seeing race or color is, has perpetuated the issue. Um, Dr. Bell is a historian and his approach to understand the history of colorism is, um, his approach is kind of to look at the historical context of colorism in the US. Um, the one drop rule was created to oppress the most number of people possible. And lighter skinned slaves were deemed as more capable, while darker skinned people were deemed as better laborers. In early mixed race schools, darker skinned students were targeted by lighter skinned students. And if teachers or officials interfered, they often did so in paternalistic ways. Um, it really enforced the idea that darker skinned students were inferior or could not speak for themselves. Mahama, a black student, used his education to write a biography about racism in the North. And in 1958, John S. Rock, who is a dentist and attorney, wrote a speech about feeling proud of his race and that he was pleased with his color. He was reclaiming black beauty and pride. We still have colorism because there's a reluctance or willful ignorance to confront this problem. It kind of falls under the umbrella of white supremacy and colorism still exists because racism still exists. And we only use people, oh, we should only use people's skin color when it is relevant to the conversation. Um, white is often the invisible default. So those were just some kind of highlights and snippets that I took from this conversation. I hope you'll all walk away with. Um, I also want to ask folks, if you enjoyed this program, please consider supporting Racial Unity Team. A lot of this program was put on with work from volunteers, um, and the Racial Unity Team is a nonprofit, and um, every dollar goes towards creating more programs like this, and it's really important that we have these conversations. So if you enjoy this program, please consider making a five, 10, 15, $50 donation to Racial Unity Team. Um, and that's just on their main website. You can follow the link and um, donate there. And we can put it in the chat box too. I know we're probably about to wrap up this call. I don't know if Tanisha or Ken, you can quickly do a, do a link to um, the Racial Unity Team's website so that folks can donate. But that would be really incredible. Thank you. Um, and thank you especially to Dr. Bell and Dr. Baumgartner for hosting this and, you know, putting, giving your time toward this program. Um, we really appreciated your words. It's really awesome. I learned a lot and I'm so grateful for your time. And thank you to everyone for coming on the call. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope that you join our next session next Saturday at 10 a.m. Um, and you can register through the same link um, that you accessed for today's Zoom. So. Thank you very much. Ken, do you want to say anything? Or are you good? Or? Yeah, let me say. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, we've been working really hard on this program for several months. And I'm very happy to see there were a lot of uh, people from all over the country. In fact, 25 uh, different uh, states were involved in registering. But 
We had 47 people today who attended and we hope that uh, you will spread the word to your friends uh, for the next two sessions. We will be hosting the uh, recording uh, and, and I'll send you an email as to where it'll be. I know for those in Exeter, it'll be with Exeter TV, but we also post it on our Facebook page and I'll send that link out to all of you so that you can share it with your friends. So we can catch up and hopefully attend the next section uh, next week. Thank you again for joining us.